Bueno, buenas tardes otra vez a todos. Gracias Good por estar. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for being with us today. And we have organized especially for you. We are going to begin with uh, the afternoon conferences. And in this section, we are going to talk about this uh, art uh, care of children with cancer. And for these uh, conversations, we are going to invite Dr. Luis Ricardo Gonzalez. He is a pediatrician from the National University Master in Palliative Care, Pediatric Palliative Care from the University of Spain, specialist in pain medicine and palliative care from Cook's University in Bogota, creator and member of uh, palliative care of La Misericordia Hospital and with Innovar Salud. He's a pioneer project in Colombia in order to create pediatric palliative care at home. It's an honor for us. Bueno, muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Jimena, for the invitation foundation by the Lili, by the Lili Foundation and all the team of the palliative care of the foundation. This is a guide in general of what we are going to talk about in the presentation. We will be talking about what generates in the decision making, it generates some difficult aspects, some factors that influence in the making decision process, the problem of uh, the mindset of a dilemma in the making decision process, trajectory of the disease and inflection point in pediatry. We talked that this is a key factor in order to orient this decision making process. This decision has to be oriented to the uh, balance, the differential experience health, illness, factors, and the assistance team, something we are going to get to after all this. There is a key phrase that I have that I am going to show you. And finally, tools in the making decision process. So we are going to, we could begin uh, the presentation with this, but I believe the main part for this final part is uh, the aspects, or the aspects I am going to mention. So I would like to start with a phrase that take us to the importance of uh, the upper to the appropriate making decision process medicine advances and nevertheless people get cured after the or illnesses that were deadly before now the options of treatment increase also the, pos the possible elections and the decisions that should be taken so the options increase and the need to uh, be prudent in the making decision increase because of course you can do a lot of harm depending on the decision you make and uh, the environment or the other people you are with and then at the end it concludes that parents and doctors they have to leave with the decisions they have made. And it depends on the exercise of this process of making decisions. In the measure that we exercise the medicine and we participate in palliative care with children and their families, there are decisions that generate some type of difficulty. Some of them generate moral stress, ethical stress, so those are the ones I am talking, showing here. One is the adaptation to diagnostic measures and therapeutic measures, uh, definition of limits, uh, the takeout or start of intervention and starting of measures that were not taken into account before. So extremely vital orders for non-reanimation that's vital support for the exercise of palliative care and also for those who are in nursing the intensive care units or urgency uh, particular interventions at the end of uh, the life um, artificial nutrition mechanical ventilation and transfusions 
and then the option if there is a diagnosis we are going to see that here. later because in the environment or the absence of one diagnosis there is a difficulty in the treatment and diagnosis in the search process and then the process of therapeutical measures the adaptation of them because it has not been a surprise the environment because there is no clear diagnosis we cannot proceed so we're going to talk about that later starting from that point i believe it is important to identify what are those factors that make influence in the making decision process because we as doctors we have to direct the tools and advise on that process the first thing is the experience that they have about the experience the disease uh, the family the professional team so we are going to see uh, what well, the experience is different for the child for the family but also is different for the professional and we think that we all see that in the same way we all carry the same process but we are not in the same stage of comprehension of the disease so this is the first factor we have to approach for the making decision understand that the making decision process is not the same for all of us the age of the patient what it allows us to understand is how the patient is going to participate in this decision making and if the patient understands the disease uh, the condition and the patient well, no matter the, that the age he or she has is the way the family and the team uh, help them uh, understand this the values and perceptions it's, i would like to say it is quality of life. It is not the same the quality of life for a certain family or other family. It's not the same for the patient, uh, Peter, or for Juana. It's not the same quality of life for patients and for the assisting personnel or team. So the procession of quality of life is not the one we have as doctors or, or, or team. It's, it is on how we have the ability to explore what implies for them, for patients to have quality of life, because we can, we can explore in this term. Relationship and, and therapeutic link in this, the type of making decision, the type of decision that we make. It's not if we start with one antibiotic or we are going to do some reanimation uh, trials or if we do a one diagnosis uh, procedure, therapeutical, so the types of decisions that are made, those are factors that imply more moral, ethical threats for assistance team. So the experiences of that assistance team. So because it's not the same expert team and uh, a team that is so expert in oncological diseases. So it is about the development of diseases. The team transmits and translates um, confidence to the family members. So here comes a term that draws my attention is the problem of the dilemma mindset. So we, we see this uh, necessity to see how to organize things. If you have everything well organized, you give a better response. It leads us to some mistakes, some frequent mistakes. It is to consider there are two sides, only black or white. For example, one side is a limitation or of a extreme, uh, and then the other one is the maximum effort, therapeutic effort. This one is the one we mostly tend to do because we have been educated for this. It leads us to a mistake because basically in the mindset of, of many is only to save lives and there is obstination again facing this is doing the work is not only saving life so we ask ourselves what is the balance then we have to find a balance so here or by organizing this it can take us to solve the problem of going to the sides to the extremes and and make mistakes and how do we get to that midpoint the trajectory of the disease is a concept that is clear to many who are listening to this conference we are going to summarize it in something very punctual is to see the whole 
uh, frame the whole movie, we could say, from the beginning to see how has this been. It is not the same story of, let's put an example of one um, problem that has responded to a treatment than another patient that didn't respond to the treatment and then goes to a transplant because of uh, problems that the person had and maybe doesn't respond. So it's the same diagnosis but the trajectory of this disease is different. So we can go move forward in this, but the trajectory of the disease is the whole movie. And then with one picture, we cannot make decisions. We have to see the whole process, the whole movie. So this is the first concept I would like to share with you. Let's sit down and dedicate ourselves to define what is the trajectory of that disease. So it also that we could transmit the parents what is the trajectory of the condition of their children. Because when this is not clear, we are in a certain stage or certain impression. So this inflection point basically is determined as the moment that is prudent and appropriate to redefine our therapeutical objectives and also define those diagnoses and treatment objectives. So here, there is a phrase that is mentioned here that it is each disease has the, its own trajectory. We have a biopsychosocial trajectory framed by it, meaningful events and transitional events related to this. So each family has a, a biopsychosocial trajectory that is different. So what is the balance to optimize diagnosis and treatments? This is part of what we want to find here. So here we have two fundamental factors, all that is technically possible and something that uh, could be of benefit. Relatively, it is easy, technically possible because each institution for each institution, but in the benefit, it goes hand in hand with the technical because what is better gives benefit changes the trajectory of the disease. But how do we achieve this balance? So technically what is possible, we have to see what is technically possible and what is technically the process uh, be of benefit. This process has to do with identifying with what I mentioned, the difference between diagnosis and condition. We have to identify also these two words that have, have a, a load of meaning that is huge needs, those things that um, children and families blame for. I blame because uh, I'm not sleeping in my bed, I'm not in my house, I cannot see my dog, or my mom is crying all the time because nobody else can take care of me. So those are the needs that the child mentions. And unfortunately, many times those needs are not taken into account by the assistance team because the assistance team, it is more important, the level of sodium, uh, if the uh, treatment was done or not. So how do we do to process or perform those uh, needs to meet those needs? So we have to put everything in the same box. Of course, we cannot mix them, but if we know how to identify the needs, we can identify the problems but also to explain the families that there will be moments in which we have to face the problems, but it doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to their needs. So we can keep track of the needs of these patients and their families. So the difference between diagnosis and condition, needs and problems. So at the end, it takes us to understand that when we have, no, when we have clarity, this or even if we have clarity we understand that the experience of health disease between parents children and the assistance team what are the factors that affect the experience first we are going to understand that there is a complex role between parents and doctors because for parents the role will be to protect to defend and it is a natural role the diagnosis of uh, one disease that has no possibility for healing uh, the parents will have in their minds, in their beliefs that they have to protect their child. So that's the way they think and the way they understand the situation. And it's not going to finish until there is the last minute of life of that child. So the role of doctors it is to defend, of course, but they have to 
treat the conditions, to treat the diseases, to treat patients and to treat families, of course, and to bring this uh, medical treatment with the ethic and the intention of uh, your benefits. So it seems like those two concepts are a part, but a part of what corresponds to us is to understand this role of protection and defense that parents have. Another factor that is important is how we understand what the child is. Basically, we can talk about uh, it's, a, it's a being with future, when the future is uh, threatened, and with all these expectations are uh, threatened or in danger by one disease, there is a change for the family, and it changes the notion or, or the understanding of this disease. It's not only to understand that you are with one disease and we have to treat it, yeah, but it implies the future of the child and the family. What is the meaning of this um, diagnosis? It is one old, it is a problem for that child and the family, and there is a relative intrusion also because is, is to tell the child or to see the child that gets uh, sick when the exam is not the adequate, the results are not the adequate, or when we don't provide appropriate information in order to understand what is the stage of the disease. So it is like that. So here in this term, there is some communication. It is to understand that the opinion of parents about the actual condition of the child changes the form in which we are going to transmit the information and we change also the way we are going to uh, approach or get the information when the medical objectives uh, are here they don't change at the same time for doctors and the assistance team then for the parents for the parents the objective is that the child is going to get better and don't die but for doctors it is the ideal but when ch things change suddenly change uh, faster. So to understand this part is key aspect in order to provide the communication and understand that their understanding is different. So talking about options of treatment that when they um, are less, so we have to understand the wishes of the family. They have to continue looking for and trying. And if at any moment objectives change, they understand that they uh, assistance team, they gave up and they have to find somewhere else and they start with the question, if I do this, if I do this other thing, the solution is to say, what are the options you can find and we will see what are the, the things we can do in order to approach this. So showing the genuine interest, if the interest is in, okay, you, you, you didn't understand me, you are not going to help me, so we lose the track. So the idea is to continue trying to do something that is continuous. So the intuition of the disease makes the parents to change the strategy constantly and redefine what implies the future and the normal, what is normal. So when the parent says, I see my child normal, but from the medical point of view, it's not like that. There is a variable of a trajectory, change of condition, change in, in perception, and then the information that is um, given meaning and use for parents and if the child is, uh, is ill or is in a good condition. So yeah, okay. Yeah, it's okay because it's not that yet. It, it, it is the expectation that it's going to get better. So the answers and the questions that we make. So the perspective of parents can be determined by you know, factors that doctors cannot change, but can understand this first step in order to achieve, not necessarily to change it, but adapt to the needs of the child. Taking this, the diagnosis and the condition, the needs and problems, it is valid to ask ourselves those questions in order to establish strategies. What do we promise to patients and their families? Are we clear with the objectives of diagnosis and therapeutic diagnosis? We explain in a good way the meaning and use of this uh, diagnosis? Having these three questions clear, if we ask ourselves these questions, and probably the answer is not the most satisfactory answer, we can find some other tools in order to optimize the making decision process. 
Entonces, ¿qué hacemos con esto? information to patient and the families. And then there is a question, where is this uh, midpoint? The midpoint is prudency. Prudence, I'm sorry, and therapeutical. So how do we achieve this? With all that I mentioned previously, achieving to establish this midpoint, this uh, therapeutic limitation, but also to make the maximum effort against vaccination. What are those strategies? This text that I mentioned here establishes a series of questions that doctors, professionals uh, ask facing the making decisions for parents. What is the strategy? What's the position that you establish or set? Uh, limit the options we provide the information. We deliver information. If it doesn't work from the medical part, we establish this as an option. Many others said, okay, to appropriate of the decision. And when we say what to do, and I don't make it to participate of the decision, I just inform. Others, what they do is to keep neutral, not to participate so much in the influence of the decisions. And others simply tell the parents all the information and tell them, hey, you, you are going to make a decision and take your own answers. So the point is, what is the assessment here? The idea is to orient this to a making decision process that is shared in order to avoid extremes or, or sides, the side of uh, pattern, uh, fatherhood, fathership, the perception of values and wishes of parents and, chi and children. And on the other side is basically the maximum autonomy. You delegate everything so they make the decision. And then there are things that can start from essential decision from parents, but other decisions cannot. So though that is another strategy is to avoid the appropriate from all the decisions and then to also to avoid leaving all the decisions to the parents. So we have to locate ourselves in the frame of shared making decisions. And this implies many things to define the best interest of children. It is not only from doctors, it is with the parents too, the capacity of participation of children and their families, of course, it should be based in understanding wishes and expectations from uh, children and adolescents and families, their families, to avoid this uh, external fatherhood of fathership. So these processes, we have to understand that this tolerance, people also expect this from the assistance team. So I put this to reconciliate with the tragedy so we see at this point ways that are bad or very bad. Unfortunately, there are situations in health that the result is not the one we want or we expect, but there are some difficult situations that we have to choose the less harmful or painful what provides the best thing for the patient. But understanding that both are going to be uh, are, are not going to have good results. So the other thing is to understand the capacity of the institution. We cannot do a transplant of uh, intestine because if we don't have the capacity, because we, and it defines the good relationship between parents, doctor, and child. And here we have the strategies that we, I wanted to gather again, the principles of bioethics are a good strategy, but are not the only one because we are going to be uh, reduced to the main uh, technique. No, maleficence is not going to be something common, but it's easier, it's more common in the things that eventually could harm than is uh, that are not so easy to define. Autonomy as a principle in terms of progression, eventually it's not going to be presence. It's not the same to treat a five-year-old child, seven-year-old child, or 15-year-old uh, adolescent. It's progressive. And in this exercise, we have to, need to understand what is autonomy and to orient parents in the best way. But 
beneficence is to identify in the families and the need of uh, the team to define the interest, the biggest interest of the child, to know what is good, what cannot be good. It is not the same for you know, all of them. Benevolence. Now, justice in the environment of one team or one health system that has resources and to understand that justice could be a factor to discuss with the system's team never, never is going to be one principle to expose a discussion with parents in order to make or not to make decisions. It cannot be, never. Because if we put this as a factor of decision on the table, it makes the parent understand that um, it's going to be a decision. It cannot be a, a factor of the decision here in the making decision process. So we can link this with something that I call the three questions. So the strategy of the three questions is the following. So let's ask ourselves, ourselves this question, this three question, the first one. What we want to do or what we want to establish can uh, eliminate or solve the problem or the disease of the child. So we have to put it in a balance risk benefit balance. So the second question, it achieves to control the course of the disease or the problem that the child has. If the answer is yes, yes, going back to, to the point of balance benefit. So if the response is not, we go to the next question and if achieves to alleviate the symptoms or suffering process? If the answer is yes, yeah, of course. Okay, let's do it. And we know what is the objective or the goal. So the three questions will define, will help us establish what's the objective of our intervention. If after the three questions we have responded that it's no, so we are in front of uh, intervention that is physiologically you feel and all these are not uh, certain questions, but they go hand in hand in the making decision process. Something to talk about before the absence of one diagnosis. This is very interesting because it establishes before the end of one child with uh, symptomatic uh, characteristics. So we provide a treatment by pediatric or any other specialties that participates on this specific therapy if we identify the problem. But if we don't have one clinical stability and we have some uh, complication or doubts, we start this uh, pediatric palliative care based in this form. We continue with cares adapted to the symptoms of the child and then we do want to advance planification, planning for the care and in parallel continue with the diagnosis efforts. So not to have diagnostic, is, it doesn't take us to limit in the making decision process in favor of the child and their families. So this is very important to take it into account. So more of the communication strategy with parents, we have to be available to talk with them, but also to be able to see the child, not because we got to a point that there's not one specific curative treatment to stop seeing that child, because we, tra we transmit abandonment so there will be options uh, in the first in institutions is the transition to that directed uh, care. So participation of uh, pediatric palliative care as an exclusion. So we cannot assume that both parts take to the same point and to the same time. Points are defined by the same factors. In summary, the recommendations to understand the values and the influence that parents have to make a make, making decision process with the parents, ask them what they want to assume and they want to do in this shared making decision process, uh, have spaces that are quiet, private, talk with children and parents in language and repetition in the communication and team work, so work in teams. And finally, to remind you, the trajectory allows explain and plan to identify needs and problems is a condition, inner condition in this process. We have to discern between diagnosis and conditions, communication, making decision that it should be shared, have this therapeutic prudence. Think always in the three questions in this environment of shared making decision process. That's what I wanted to share with you. I wanted to put many examples because I have many examples in my mind, 
but uh, of course, uh, it's a limited the time. Thank you very much for this time. This is my emails. So you can ask me questions and share your experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, for this excellent presentation. A very complete, practical presentation. And I believe it is one of the most challenging scenarios in children with uh, threading conditions. So it is a making decision process. So that's why I'm sure that it's uh, going to be very worth for. Thank you very much. We now continue with our after and conferences at the Palpec Symposium. Right now, we are going to listen to the Dr. Joanne Wolf with the conference Gold of Care as a fundamental PPC intervention. And she's also a Gold of Care in Children with Cancer. She's the director of Periodic Palliative Care at Boston Children's Hospital or the Dana Farmer Institute. She's also the director of the uh, Pediatric Palliative Care, Boston Children's Hospital, and also pediatrics professors at the Medicine School in Harvard. So she's been also part of the Palliative Care team, named pac and is the service that she directs. And in 2001, she received a honor mention in the Circle Life of Water uh, from the Society, uh, American Society of uh, Hospitals, where they promote and highlight a innovative, uh, focused sort of approach to uh, the care of children. In this case, so she's also uh, chairman of the uh, American Academy in 2019 and 2020. And well, so I can continue here with our long list of all the recognition that she has received. So thank you, Dr. Wolf, for accepting the, this invitation. It's a honor to have you here. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to um, be here this afternoon. And I wish that I were able to meet you all in person, but we'll just have to say that will happen another time. Um, today, I would like to cover the following ob objectives. I wanna to talk together about the value of a goals of care discussion in pediatric advanced cancer, to describe the fundamentals of a goals of care discussion, and then to identify language that may disrupt and or facilitate goals of care discussions. So to begin, I want you to think for just 10 seconds to yourself why communicating is so difficult. Specifically, is if, you, if you think about it, we're all born with the capability, most of us uh, that is, to communicate to either verbally or sign language, but in some way it's a natural innate um, a skill that we all develop as we grow up. At the same time, it seems that it's hard uh, to get it right as healthcare professionals. And so the question is why? And I'll share some data that might answer this question. First of all, there's little education in how to develop strong communication skills. So for example, in this study, 80% of pediatric hematology oncology fellows or trainees reported that communication training is important. However, 32% only received communication other than just watching someone, direct observation. And then the, so one of the challenges is that communication is in, in medicine, in advanced care is a skill and we're not being taught how to do that skill. And the other is attitudes. So for example, in this very early study, Dr. Hilden and, college, and, and colleagues asked oncologists, what is the greatest barrier to difficult conversations? And what, what we answered as oncologists was, 
it's because of family unrealistic expectations, family denial, family conflicts, patient denial. So what does that suggest to all of us? We find these conversations difficult because we blame the family. We put the responsibility on them and not taking the responsibility ourselves. If we look at, on the other hand, what happens when we speak with families, in these conferences, about 73% of the time, we providers speak and only 27% of the time do parents speak. And most of the time we're talking about medical information and only 20% of the time are we actually trying to understand parent values and preferences and of course those of our older patients as well. And yet family satisfaction, their, uh, their satisfaction with these conversations is inversely related to how much time the physician speaks. So as the physician talking goes down, family satisfaction goes up. Further, in our recent study led by Dr. Danielle DeForsi, we defined advanced care planning um, and asked bereaved families what they thought about the importance of advanced care planning. And we defined advanced care planning as typically made with your medical team to help others understand the best way to care for your child and fulfill your wishes in the event of an acute illness or sudden deterioration in your child's condition. And families rated the importance of doing this advanced care planning. And a majority of families said this was very important. So even though we think families are in denial and don't wanna talk about it, families are telling us that this is very important. And in fact, families also told us that they mostly want to understand, do these kinds of conversations either at the time of diagnosis or perhaps when they realize their child has a serious illness but has not yet deteriorated or when the child's care team believes that he or she will not survive, but certainly not at the very last minute. So I hope that you agree with me that having conversations that plan in advance what's most important to patients and families is a high priority and that we need to have the skills to, to have these conversations. And I call that a goals of care conversation. So let's, I'll, let's talk about a particular situation with a patient by the name of Mary that I took care of many years ago. Mary was diagnosed at six years of age with a central nervous system low-grade glioma she lived in a rural area with her, her parents and her older sister, and she was a very upbeat child who loved school and friends. So my question to you to think to yourself is, does Mary need a goals of care discussion? Do we need to understand what's most important to this family in order to take care of Mary and her family. This is an early diagnosis of cancer that's very treatable. And I would suggest that in order to establish an outstanding relationship and be able to care for this child and family in a way that's consistent with their values and goals, we absolutely need to have a goals of care conversation. I consider this conversation to be a fundamental procedure just like learning how to put in a central line or an endotracheal tube is a procedure that requires skills and that there are ways to go about it in a very systematic manner, so too is a goals of care conversation. And so how do you have a goals of care conversation? Well, to me, it's pretty simple. There are six questions that you need to incorporate, oops, six questions that you need to incorporate into your discussion with these children and their families. And the most important very first question is a way to develop a therapeutic alliance with the family 
through just being curious about that child and that family, not just saying, you know, not just asking them, for example, what brought you here today, which is the typical uh, uh, question, but rather tell me about yourself or tell us about your child, what she like as a person, what she like outside the hospital or outside the clinic. And as soon as you ask that question, families will realize that you are different. You want to know them as people, as individuals. And so that sets, sets the stage for a very authentic relationship. The next question is, what is your understanding? Now that we've told you about the disease, what is your understanding of your child's illness? You wanna hear what families have integrated into their understanding. Further, you ask, in light of your understanding, what's most important to you? What are you hoping for? And then you ask, what are your worries and what are your fears? Another question that's really important is, in times of difficulty, where do you find your strength? And for us, that means that families will share with us what their community resources are, whether or not they have a faith that gives them strength, whether or not they find strength in their family and friends. And then the follow-up question to this is, how well is that working for you? Because of course we know that in uncovering these resources, it may be that they're having a crisis of faith or that their friends have disappeared and we therefore need to know how to help them. And the last question is, how do you manage day to day? How are you functioning day to day? And for this, we understand whether or not there's economic hardship, difficulty putting food on the table or difficulty filling medication prescriptions. And through all these, converse, these questions, we start to understand what's most important to the family in the context of that serious illness. Very importantly, when we have these conversations, families will express emotions. And that's one of the greatest barriers to providing, uh, to having these conversations. As clinicians, it's hard for us to efface the strong emotions that our patients and our families express. And so another skill is learning how to respond to emotions. How do you react when someone expresses frustration, expresses sadness? It's overwhelming as clinicians. And so we need to have skills and practice those skills in order to be able to respond. So there's a mnemonic called nurse in English. And, uh, the first thing you can do is, and very importantly, is name the emotion. So it sounds like you're very worried about what's going on. Another strategy is to understand the core message. If I understand you correctly, you're worried about what to tell your child or to show respect and reassurance at the right time. If someone's expressing distress over how they're doing as a parent, you can say, you're such a loving parent, or a, a show of support, um, how you can support the family. Would you like me to talk to your child about this? For example, take away some of the burden from the parent or from the child. Another strategy is to explore. I notice that you're upset. Can you tell me what you're thinking about? And that to me is really a, a really important strategy to sort of understand more what's underneath the emotion. And finally, what also works is silence. Just being with the distress and not feeling like we have to fix it, but simply to be silent even for just five seconds. And so when we have these conversations, what we come away with is our understanding of what the family understands and what's important to them and what their worries are and how they're coping. And we then are responsible for summarizing and delineating the goals of care. So our summary of that conversation 
is what I call the goals of care. And the secret is that there's really only three goals of care when it comes to taking care of families of children with serious illness. Those goals of care fall into three buckets. For a patient like Mary at the very beginning, that bucket is likely going to be that their goal is for their child Mary or Mary's goal for herself is to live as long as possible and to worry less about quality of life because the hope is that we can uh, attend to that later on. So that's one common goal. Another common goal is at the towards the more advanced stages of illness for the hope to live as comfortably as possible. So perhaps when someone is, is almost certainly going to die from their illness. But for those of us taking care of seriously ill children and their families, the most common goal and what parents tell us through these conversations is that they hope to control the disease for as long as possible and they hope for comfort and well-being. And so the goal is that they're hoping that their child live as long and as well as possible. So those are all the goals that typically emerge, just one of these three possibilities falling into one of these buckets. And so once we have the goals, we then know how to take care of the patient. If it's live as long as possible, we evaluate or assess that patient intensively. We provide intensive treatment and we always follow up intensively. If that goal is to live as long as possible and as well as possible, we may be more focused in our assessment and more targeted in our treatment, but we will always follow up intensively. And if the goal is to live as comfortably as possible, we might be more limited in our evaluation or assessment. We may use flexible and very empiric treatment trials, but we will always follow up intensively. And so for Mary, her goal at the very beginning was to live as long as possible. And so what we did for Mary was give her a, a, a chemotherapy regimen. We provided intensive psychosocial and spiritual support. She was able to continue in school and complete her therapy. And then about 10 years later, Mary presented with very severe pain in her back and headaches. And she, had, she underwent lots of scans of her brain and MRIs. And at first, she wasn't uncovered to have any recurrence and maybe was thought to have a pain syndrome or migraines. But then several months later, she actually developed cord compression and was found to have now visible metastatic disease throughout her spine. And she had continued to live with her parents and remained passionate about school and even started to paint. So what's next? What do we do when she presents with this, these new findings? Well, we have another goals of care conversation. This is what we call re-goaling, revisiting that same conversation and de delineating what's most important to Mary and her family. And in this case, it was to live as long as possible and as well as possible. She wanted continued cancer-directed therapy. We provided, but she did not want to lose her hair. She wanted to remain at home and in school and not be hospitalized. She wanted her symptoms to be managed proactively and she wanted to continue painting. And so for Mary, we ended up providing a very intensive cancer-directed therapy regimen that was oral, but didn't create hair loss, and then intensive symptom management so that she can continue in her day-to-day -day activities. So I wanna briefly now turn to language that can sometimes disrupt or improve our goals of care conversations. And this is Dr. Eric Cassell, and as I was saying earlier, similar to scalp, he said, similar to scalpels for surgeons. Words are the palliative care clinician's greatest tools. 
surgeons learn to use these tools with extreme precision because any error can be devastating. So too should clinicians use who rely on words learn to use them with precision because our words can be very harmful. And I don't have time to necessarily explore with you words that may be harmful or send unintended messages. So I will share some of them with you that come to my mind. And when we see each other in the future, we can talk through each of these individually. But the one that I wanted to focus on is a lot of terminology about battling cancer and being aggressive in treatment. Um, and I share this because it affects families and, and children in a very profound way when we always talk about fighting and that if they don't fight, they've lost the battle. And so it blames the child for that. I'm going to very briefly read to you a, this was a mother's eulogy for her son, Nate, who died of cancer. And at the very bottom of this eulogy, she says the following. Often we hear about a child battling cancer as if he is at war with his own body. But this metaphor is unfair. It assumes that the child somehow has control over his disease and plays a role in his own success or failure to cure it. Nate understood the complexity of his situation and chose to focus on making every day count. A few months ago, Nate posted a picture of himself on Instagram and was angered by someone's comment, keep fighting. To the rest of us, it seemed a perfectly reasonable comment, but Nate said, why do people think I spend my time fighting every day? I am just living like everyone else. So let's be careful about our words and how they send messages to our patients. I will close with helping to give you some phrases that I find helpful and what I call my toolbox phrases. I keep them in my pocket for times to sort of promote conversation or help me with difficult conversations. So these phrases are the icebreaker. So one icebreaker that I told you about how to start a conversation is tell me about yourself as a person, what you're like outside the hospital, for example. Another icebreaker, let's, let's imagine we're talking about a little baby and we don't yet know what that child's life is outside the hospital. So I might say to a parent, tell me about your child's name. How did you choose your child's name? And there is always a story. It could be I read a magazine and I really like that name. Or it could be my child's named after his great, great, great grandfather. And in that, we hear about the family and families love talking about it. We already talked in detail about responding to emotion, but my, one of my favorite responses when someone is upset in front of me and I feel upset and I feel paralyzed for words, after some silence, I say, I can't imagine what this must be like for you. And that's a, an expression of empathy that is often very well received. So I pull it out of my pocket and I use that expression. Another important strategy is how to keep your time short with families. We know that these conversations can go on and on and it's important to allow for a lot of time on the one hand and on the other hand we need to be we need to take care of other patients so my strategy is i have about 10 minutes i'll start a conversation or i have about 30 minutes so that i set the conversation up with a time frame and then when i'm getting close to the end of the conversation i summarize so what i'm hearing is so that you can you could speak back what the family said to you. And you can also say, I'm aware of the time. And if you haven't finished the conversation, then you can set up a time to follow up again. Finally, there are some additional phrases that often come into play when I'm trying to help families with decisions. 
And I might say, loving parents have decided this for their child and equally loving parents have decided that. Or sometimes when I'm trying to help other doctors and clinicians think about a new way of solving a problem, I speak up by starting off very gently. I wonder, I wonder if we should consider this. It's a gentle interjection. And then the other strategy that's very helpful is to acknowledge a parent who might have uh, hopes that are, that are very hard to fulfill. And you might align with the parent by saying, I wish that were possible. I worry that time is short. I wish and I worry. So those are some additional phrases to have in your toolbox. And what if you make a mistake? The best thing to do is to simply say, I'm sorry. So back to Mary, her disease progressed. And despite in ongoing chemotherapy and int intensive symptom management, so I ask you again, and I hope you all can answer this question, what's next? Another goals of care conversation. And for Mary, now her goal was to live as comfortably as possible. And this is what her mother said at the very end of life. To me, the hospital room was beyond words, the hospital stay in our last day with Mary. To have the safety of the hospital, doctors, nurses, all caregivers, father, me, and for us to be with her until the end was the ultimate blessing. With that, I say thank you. And just a note that there will be an a international conference on pediatric palliative care by a virtual conference called Epic Pediatrics, which is where these slides come from. Um, uh, and it's going to be at the very beginning of March and in Spanish for those in Latin America. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to uh, sign up. Gracias. Dr. Wolf, muchísimas gracias, como siempre. Dr. Wolf, thank you very much. Every time we see you, we learn a lot, not only uh, about the words, but also in the way you express and you transmit those words. We can see all the love and compassion you do your work. So thank you very much. Bueno, nuevamente juntos y ya para welcome back and to close this um, symposium. Pediatric Palliative Care, we are going to welcome Dr. Justin Baker with his conference, Integral and Multidisciplinary Care Attention for Children with Cancer. He's an oncologist, pediatrician, chief of the Quality and Palliative Care Unit of uh, Hospital Medical Center and Director of Oncology Program of St. Jude Medical Center. He has been recognized in multiple occasions. He won the prize as the inspirational leader of the American chain of uh, palliative care. And in the year 2008, also one more recognition by the American Academy of Hospice uh, and Palliative Care as one of the researchers, young researchers in the area of palliative care. It is an example and a model to follow for all of us in Latin America. Thank you for being here, Doctor. Friends, it is such a privilege to be here. Uh, as Dr. Wolf mentioned, the only thing that I would wish more than being here is being all together, actually, in person. Uh, hopefully next year um, or coming soon. I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about comprehensive and multidisciplinary care of children with cancer. And, and I really wanna compliment uh, Dr. Jimena Garcia on the creation and kind of working through the agenda because I feel like it's really built nicely um, with, with Dr. Gonzalez and then Dr. Wolf and, and now leading into some of the things that I'd like to share with you. And so this has been just a wonderful afternoon so far. Uh, I wanna speak to you a little bit about um, some things that Dr. Gonzalez mentioned and, 
when we think about palliative care and, and when we think in this context about comprehensive care, uh, I like to think about palliative care as quality of life and, and that we must focus, just as Dr. Wolf mentioned, we really have to think about comfort and quality of life as a key priority for so many of our patients and families. And, and the word palliative, many people don't know what palliative care is and don't really understand that word. And, and the word actually means to cloak or to cover. And, and I put these pictures up here because when you think about palliative care, I'm actually a palliative oncologist, meaning I'm a palliative care specialist and an oncologist. And I want you to think of these either holiday sweaters with the koalas on them or with my koala outfits up for when we dressed up as Halloween as this extra layer of, of care that is there to, to cloak or to cover. And then I want you to think of the word compassion because as Dr. Wolf mentioned and, and was speaking so articulately about and wonderfully about from her experience and it, we really have to recognize that by suffering together with our patients and families, that's what compassion means to suffer with, by suffering with them, we're able to take some of that suffering off of them. And this is in a very therapeutic manner that I'm describing here, uh, but I'll try to give you some specific techniques as we think about this. So our objectives for today are to talk a little bit, a little bit about some of the barriers to holistic care in the care of children with cancer. I'm gonna describe and give you some rationale for multidisciplinary relationship-based care uh, in their care. And then I'm gonna demonstrate a technique and, and as a skill, show you a little bit about uh, a way to promote multidisciplinary collaboration in your setting. Uh, and as, as uh, Dr. Garcia has mentioned, these slides will be available to you um, at the end. I'm gonna come back to this multiple times because I think this speaks to the need, tremendous need for holistic, a holistic approach. Uh, Many, many years ago, um, Cicely Saunders introduced us to the concept of total pain. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about total suffering. When I think about the disease that I treat as an oncologist, I think about uh, that being cancer. When I think about incorporating as a disease, uh, what I do at, in palliative care, the disease is suffering. And when we think about a holistic approach to treating the child with cancer, we really have to think about treating both that cancer as well as suffering. And when you look at suffering, you can see all the different ways that it comes into account. You can think of suffering as it comes from disease management, suffering from pain and other symptoms, psychological distress from depression, anxiety, or other fear, social issues, cultural values, beliefs, and practices, and how those may be impacted. In fact, as Dr. Wolf mentioned, uh, uh, she mentioned Dr. Eric Cassell, one of the things that he said is one of the greatest things we lose in the midst of illness is relationships. And the impact of illness on that, on relationships causes tremendous suffering. Spiritual issues, existential or transcendental issues. There can be practical uh, issues related to activities of daily living, or as Dr. Wolf mentioned, going to school or, or, or just trying to facilitate the day by day. Certainly, as there's disease progression, we can speak about suffering related to end of life care and the suffering that grief and bereavement uh, entail. And I think what I'd like to do right now is just pause for a second with this slide up there and think to yourself, how well equipped are you to deal with all of these issues, every single one of them, to be an expert in prescribing high dose opioids for pain, to deeply look into the existential distress of a suffering child, to think about the social context of trying to transition a patient into uh, school and allowing them to continue with school and with their homework and helping them be as, as normal as they possibly can in those moments, that intimidates me asking those questions, thinking about all of this. This is why we all bring so much to the table and we all must contemplate how we can address suffering as a team in this multidisciplinary fashion. One of the most important tools, and Dr. Wolf so beautifully and, art, uh, so beautifully and artfully described this, one of our most important tools in addressing suffering are our ears. 
And when you think about God made us with two ears and one mouth for a reason. That's what my grandmother always used to tell me. And she would say, Justin, it's always better to be listening than having your mouth constantly moving. And Mark Nepo says, to listen is to lean in softly with a willingness, with an open heart to be changed by what we hear. And interestingly, in the context of suffering, of multidisciplinary collaboration and care, listening is one of the greatest tools that we can have. There's tremendous complexity in, in uh, marching through decisions. And, and Dr. Gonzalez very artfully spoke to this as well. And, and what I'll say is there are many different contributing factors to making these decisions. And as you progress through those three areas, as uh, Dr. Wolf described, as we work towards the goals of care, look at all of these things that are weighing in. That's an awful lot to take in and to think that as a physician, I should be able to weigh all of those myself. It just doesn't make any sense. And yet it's critical as we contemplate the goals of care and the future treatment options that we factor all, all of these things in. And then as Dr. Gonzalez alluded to, it's very hard for me to show this slide without saying too often we do because we can, not necessarily fully contemplating if we should. Again, that doesn't mean we shouldn't, but it at least means we should contemplate, should we? And also a choice is only a choice if it's indeed a choice. I feel very strongly about this. If somebody in the room recognizes that a patient wouldn't want that to be offered in any way, shape, form, or fashion, and it would cause more harm than good to offer it, we then should be more paternalistic in our approach and choose not to make that a choice for that patient and family. Coming back to our concept of total suffering, one of the things that is causes a, a very significant amount of suffering and that we're frankly not very good at, at addressing, Dr. Wolf had sh has shown this in multiple of her studies, is physical symptomatology. And I wanna put up very key critical things that you can do to make a difference. The very first thing is to assess, do your best to prevent and treat pain and other symptoms. Think about symptoms that are causing the greatest concern and do something about it. I recognize that there are many clinicians here who perhaps are not physicians. There, there may be chaplains, nurses, social workers, psychologists, uh, physical therapists. You may think to yourself, it's not my job to assess a patient's breathing issues. I'll tell you that it absolutely is your job because all of us have to recognize that in assessing pain and other symptoms that will help our patient in this holistic approach towards addressing suffering. Also, those of us in this room must recognize, in this conference must recognize, we cannot be an opiophobe. We cannot be afraid to prescribe opioids and we have to help families realize they should not either. And then combining many concepts into this one slide, Patients who suffer a difficult moment at the time of death, those families seem to really struggle in their grief and bereavement. So we must do everything we can to prevent pain and a difficult moment at the time of death. When we think, unfortunately, about multiply relapsed cancer, though, there is obviously periods of decline and crises, and these are unfortunately happening in the midst of increasing symptom burden. And, and we also know that, as I mentioned before, Dr. Wolf's study demonstrated to us that we don't do a great job of addressing these symptoms. You can see on the bottom in, in uh, the bottom right of this slide that more than 60% of patients as they're approaching the end of life are experiencing distress related to pain. That's terrible and we have to do better. And you can see all the other symptomatology there. Interestingly, uh, a remarkable researcher, Dr. Ethan Bash, uh, he demonstrated that if all we do is use patient-reported outcome symptom monitoring uh, versus just usual care, so this is a, a proactive assessment of symptoms, patients even had better outcomes from a length-of-life standpoint, better survival. This is incredible to me, and when I, when I challenge myself to think about this, 
I think it's because the reality is I'm not very good at assessing symptoms because I do this on my own. And I walk into a room and I may ask somebody, how are you feeling today? Instead of really going into detail about that symptoms, instead of really leaning into that moment. And, and just as Dr. Wolf mentioned with the nurse acronym, kind of leaning into those emotions, leaning into the symptoms that are there and listening fully to that situation. I want to share with you a story and, and talk to you about Emma. And Emma uh, was a, a patient who had an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. And this, it was metastatic at the time that she was diagnosed uh, when she was 13 years old. And Emma uh, was one of the very few kids who was cured of her rhabdomyosarcoma. She only had about a five to 10% chance of long-term survival. Well, she was cured of it, but unfortunately, five years down the road, she developed a leukemia that was related to her treatment. And she had to undergo a bone marrow transplant after a very uh, appropriate goals of care conversation, as Dr. Wolf described, uh, she affirmed that she would like to move forward with a bone marrow transplant and live as long as possible. And in that construct, she actually was doing very well. Her, her transplant had gone well, but she was having severe diarrhea. And at this point, she had been independent and in college, but this diarrhea was causing her to um, lose her independence. And she found herself in a deep, dark hole. I sat down with Emma uh, for four consecutive days. And if you looked at how much diarrhea she was having on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, it was the exact same amount of diarrhea. I was unable to do a good job intervening to decrease the amount of diarrhea. But she said, talking to a compassionate listener made her feel like a new person. In fact, you can see this is written up in the New York Times. She felt so strongly about simply sitting and feeling heard about her diarrhea that she contacted the New York Times to have them write this story. It is makes such a difference to recognize, just as Dr. Wolf mentioned, that each person's reality has to be individualized. We have to understand what is causing the most suffering for that particular person. In reality, uh, Emma in this situation didn't need a doctor. She needed somebody to lean into that moment and talk with her about how difficult these times were. One of the other things that we also have to recognize is that we must create an opportunity for very ill children to receive care and die in their preferred location of death, even if that location is at home, and even if it's extremely complicated. I think some of you may say, well, you know, Justin, you're talking to me from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital where you have a lot of resources, or, or Dr. Wolf comes from uh, Harvard and from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute where there's a lot of resources. I put this picture up here because actually one of the best hospices that I've been to is in Zimbabwe, Africa. And this picture is our interdisciplinary care team meeting in Zimbabwe, Africa. And they provide phenomenal care with very, very limited resources. And so we must commit to supporting patients and families in whatever setting that they would choose. And, and uh, I think this is a wonderful example of multidisciplinary collaboration to address suffering in the context of progressing illness. Our team here, we do, we have a, a, an amazing team and we're able to provide care in the home setting that is really wonderful and helpful. And we have multidisciplinary care that goes into uh, the home setting with our patients and families. I think one of the aspects that sometimes we forget about in the context of multidisciplinary care of children with cancer and how this can really address issues related to suffering, these children themselves are tremendously suffering their own loss. They are very frequently and regularly contemplating how they're not going to be able to accomplish their own goals of care. And so we really need to think about, and, and maybe I didn't use the right title here when it says legacy development, but we want to help our kiddos and their families think about what it is that's most important to them. And this is why I feel so fortunate to come after Dr. Wolf, because these examples that I want to share with you were significant sources of distress. And, and it only came about because of multidisciplinary collaboration. This patient on the left here, this, her name is Amber. And Amber, as she would 
uh, described to us what was most important to us. She had a terrible rhabdomyosarcoma on the back of her, her throat. Her psychologist, she confide, confided in and said, the part that is most difficult about knowing that I am dying is that I am not going to be able to see my baby sister. It was only because of that conversation and, and the depth of which she really felt strongly about this that we decided to move forward and, and offer her a, a, a tracheostomy as you see here. And because of that, she actually had this picture later where she's holding her little sister and, and we were able to move forward and, and, and allow for her to experience that. Or uh, in the middle here, you can see uh, these birthday parties and this is a cake. Our social workers sent this picture to me yesterday. One of our patients who is approaching the end of his life, it's not his birthday. And he wanted to have a cake with minions as a part of it to celebrate his family. And this social worker contacted us and said, what can we do? How can we make this happen? This is what is most important to Camden at this time. And we were able to help them come up with this cake. I can't believe this is a cake, but it is a cake that you're looking at in the middle there. Or our, one, of, one of the really incredible patients I cared for, her name uh, was Lizzie. And Lizzie, as she was approaching the end of life, she was working with our music therapist. And our music therapist asked her, Lizzie, what is it that's most important to you? And she said, I really want to leave a song for each of the people that I love most in my life. It's very important to me that I'm able to uh, let them know how much they mean to me by sending them this so these songs. And, and I want to share one of those songs with you, and I hope it, I hope it projects okay. Amen, I can see your face. Are you able to hear that or no? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> no worries. I will tell you that she selected the song that I was playing there as perfect, the song by Ed Sharon. And she sang it along with our music therapist and then gave that to her mother. In speaking with her mother, Lizzie's now, she died about three years ago. In speaking to her mother, her mother said she listens to that song almost every day. And we were able to accomplish that for her only because that music therapist, that multidisciplinary collaboration recognized that the thing that was most important to Lizzie at that moment was to provide these things for those loved ones. One of the things that we also must make sure to recognize is we want to try to prevent regret. Suffering can come in the form of regret. When I talk to bereaved families, it's not uncommon that they will say, oh, I just wish I would have done something differently. I wish uh, I would have approached things differently. So we must do everything we can to prevent regret and provide effective anticipatory guidance. When we think about the regrets of, of uh, bereaved parents, they may have regrets about choosing or not choosing the last course of chemotherapy. They ha may have regrets about not talking to their child about their child's soon coming death. I'll tell you that one of the best ways to have these kinds of conversations with the child is to have no conversation at all and to be uh, work with play therapists and art therapists or music therapists, just as our music therapist described in, in uh, the slide before this with Lizzie. Not choosing the best location of death, as I spoke about sometimes uh, because parents don't feel well prepared, they may not feel like they chose the best location of death or perhaps didn't involve enough psychosocial support or even palliative care uh, early enough. And sometimes they worry because they didn't or regret not getting a chance to appropriately say goodbye. One of the important things to know is that if parents do have regrets, they have higher levels of anxiety and depression, they miss more days of work, they have worse quality of life, and they have higher mortality rates. So what we must recognize is that appropriate grief and bereavement support is actually a public health necessity. And I think what I, what I wanna challenge you with right now is that you, you are a critical component of your family's grief and bereavement journey. We did a study here that asked parents what is it that we could provide in that grief and bereavement journey uh, to help them take appropriate steps moving forward? And this quote I think is so powerful and it's, I often say I have a hole in my heart 
and I can hear the wind blow through it. Some days I actually hear the wind whistle through my heart. If I don't feel that way, I think there's something wrong. These parents told us that it's critical that you have a strong and ongoing relationship even during their grief and bereavement process. It helps them a lot. They spoke about the importance, as Dr. Wolf mentioned, of high quality communication between healthcare providers and families. And unfortunately, they told us about the negative impact that experiences, negative experiences between healthcare providers and families can also have on their grief. Meaning you can do something while that child is alive that will deeply impact that grief and bereavement experience. And they told us there's a significant, there's a real importance of the institution in also supporting that grief journey. And given what they've said, we've really created a robust grief and bereavement program and, and we're studying these interventions on a regular basis. But the main point I wanted to get across to you all is it's very common. 10 years ago at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, there was not a single bit of bereavement work going on, absolutely nothing. There was people that would send cards. There was some follow-up phone calls that would happen, but none of it was in an organized way and it was not systematic in any way. And it started with just one person, Dr. Clark, who now champions all of this work and, and now works with bereaved parents and, and has a really profound, we have a really wonderful program here that I'd be very happy to speak to you about in the future. Finally, when you think about multidisciplinary collaboration, uh, I can't close without saying, recognize that access to pa specialty palliative care is a right, not a privilege. Just as many people have already spoken about and, and this particular talk addresses, there's no way that palliative care people can be in charge of issues related to suffering. It must be all of our job, but please recognize that we are here to help and that we can be a part of that process. And unfortunately, when we look at what is the uh, most common barrier to early integration or appropriate integration of palliative care, at least here in the United States, it's quite common that there's a phrase called the they are not ready syndrome and saying that a family is not ready to meet the palliative care team. Well, we studied that and we actually found that most commonly that's a projection from the medical staff and that the family would actually be quite willing to meet with palliative care providers right at the very beginning of the illness trajectory. So as we close, I bring us back to this slide and want us to all recognize that there's no way any one of us can do this together. This concept of total suffering is absolutely critical. When I think about what skill to leave you with today, I wanna pause on this particular slide. What we know at this point is, and what I've tried to get across is it really takes you know, basically a village. It takes a team to make sure that we're addressing this holistic, the holistic needs of the patient and family. You can see here, this is an example potentially of a team, and it's not uncommon at all that individually we're each doing work with that patient and family. You can see the psychologist, as I've described, is doing work, and the palliative care physician or the social worker, all of us are doing individual work we must all come together in an interdisciplinary team meeting where all of us are willing to share our perspectives and work towards coming up with a plan that we might offer. And then in the midst of either goals of care conversations or points of duress or times when it's really needed, we must contemplate a family care conference and sitting down with the family in a group setting instead of simply individually. And, and this is a critical model that, that may change the way that you think about things. This is not something we have to do every single day with every single patient. There, there's a lack of efficiency there, but we must recognize that in times of duress, we really all need to get around a table or, or all around a virtual setting like we're in today and have a conversation about how can we best support the quality of life? How can we best address the suffering? How can we best promote the best day for these pa this patient and family possible. And so again, uh, I wanna, we'll be handing these slides out to you and I would hope you'd think about instituting this kind of model at your setting um, if you don't already have that. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be here. And um, Dr. Jimena, we're just, I'm just so grateful, so, so grateful for the opportunity to 
uh, discuss this critical issue and, and the importance of multidisciplinary collaboration in, in these patients and families. Muchas gracias, Dr. Justin, por estar con nosotros y por compartir este Thank programa. Thank you, Dr. Justin, for being with us and sharing this excellent program that you have. And it puts us a, a high challenge because we want to provide the best care to our patients, even if we are in a different context. So we are going to go to a Q&A session. All right, perfect. We have several questions from the public, for the audience. So we are going to begin with a question for the Dr. Wolf. So Dr. Joanne, how, I mean, you were talking in some certain moments about the oncology and palliative teens, and they are facing some re emotional reactions. Sometimes those emotions are very strong, fear, frustrations, uncertainty towards the news that we have to give. And you gave us some tips, let's say, to react. But the question here is, once we are facing this uh, type of situation, this kind of situation, so what can we do in order to avoid the fatigue, you know, the tiredness mm. as a team? What a great question. Um, you're right that even if we have great skills and experience in communicating to bear witness and empathize and um, sort of embrace uh, family suffering as, as Dr. Baker alluded to, um, that takes a toll on each of us as individuals. And it is critically important to figure out how to take care of oneself. Now, I say that, and I also recognize that people's clinical lives are extraordinarily busy and I have heard from different places around the world that they are even busier than I can possibly imagine. And so I appreciate that I'm, I'm actually talking from a place of privilege in some ways uh, because it's easier perhaps for me to take care of myself and think about how to do that uh, compared to other people who may have even less time or moments in their days and weeks as they face this suffering. That being said, it's no excuse. And um, I think that self-care doesn't have to take up even a lot of time in order to be greatly beneficial. So I am going to actually give the podium over to Dr. Baker, who taught me about a quick strategy, even in moments of the day, about how to take a deep breath and be able to move forward. But before I do that, I'm gonna say that in general, we need to think together as teams to think about team strategies about self-care. And then we have to take responsibility as our own individuals because one size does not fit all. And so for some people, solace and rejuvenation might come from attending church services. For another, it might be to take a half an hour walk in the woods or on the beach. And so in order to do what works for us as individuals, we have to make a self-care plan and stick with that self-care plan. But I'm going to ask Dr. Baker to teach us about how to take care of ourselves in the moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf. Uh, it, it is amazing. Um, to have, again, this opportunity to speak to this first question. As I was cutting slides because I had too many slides, this was the one section I left out. And so thank you for the opportunity to speak to this. Um, the, there is an acronym, again, in, in the United States here in English that is called STOP. So S-T-O-P. 
And it's actually a mindfulness technique. And I'd like for each of us to do it right now because we're going to practice it, not just hear about it. So again, the S of stop is actually stop. So we stop what we're doing. The T, we take a breath. The O, we observe our body. And in this moment, I'm sensing that I was a little bit stressed in my shoulders. So I'm trying to release that stress a little bit. I'm continuing to breathe deeply and I'm centering myself in this moment. And it's only when I'm fully centered that I pee, proceed. So you can use this in all of your interactions with your patients and families. You may come from a very difficult moment with where, where you perhaps were doing a goals of care conversation as Dr. Wolf alluded to and, and, and again articulated so well the steps to. You may even cry as a clinician in the middle of that. But as you step away and step out of that room, make sure before going to the next room that you stop, you take a breath, you observe your body, all of that before you proceed. And that will make sure you're centered in the moment. And then you'll, I already feel better. I already noticed my tension in my shoulders and even here in my chest going down as I'm simply breathing deeper and slowing myself down. So it's a very simple technique that if employed throughout the day can make a big difference. One last thing I wanna say, and this again gets very much along the lines of what Dr. Wolf mentioned, it's a very common phrase that we use here. Self-care is not selfish. It is critical for your team, for yourself, and for you to make a big difference in all these patients and families' lives by being able to be 100% present with them. Perfect. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Well, Thank you very much, Dr. Baker and Dr. Wolf. Um, I hope that everybody pay attention to this because sometimes we have very difficult and tough days. I also would like to ask a question to Dr. Luis Ricardo. His presentation was uh, very practical about a decision-making process in children with these features or characteristics. So you're explaining I mean, these uh, three questions, stirs and answering yes or no. And uh, depending on the answers, we are led to make, the, made, to make the best decision for this child. Is there exist any recommendation for registering this decision-making process in the clinical history? I mean, is there any specific something we need to write down before or after? Well, as a, re, as a specific recommendation, like do it like this and don't do it like that. Well, I, it has to do with do it so that any person who can read the history, medical history or record would be able to understand what you did, the discussion that you have with the patients and the families, for example, but especially you need to understand why you are doing what you are doing and why uh, you made those conclusions. So clarity needs to be very clear it's in the history records, also with the possibility for other people that sometimes they are not immersed in the team, they could be aligned with what it's been mentioned. So I feel that the technological part help us to uh, seize the time, seize the day, because uh, it helped us, but also sometimes we just copy and paste, and sometimes we just see the clinical records, records with uh, some children with uh, serious illnesses, and I mean, everything is important, but in copy and paste, sometimes the diagnosis uh, is like a plus 15 in a diagnosis in the day or something, but what I mean is about the concept of the analysis. It needs to be a concept and an analysis. It's not to repeat of the diagnosis or prognosis. You really need to write down what you really did. And at the end of the day, the clinical reports or records, and there should be the reasons for some decisions that were taken. It has to be reasoned what it was talked with the 
parents with the child for the decision-making process and not only the phrase like we have talked with the parents we provide explanation and solve questions and answers because sometimes we don't even do that so as a summary is to be organized to write down what you really did and another important point about this is I wish we could solve all these three questions in only one intervention, but it is not possible to do it only one intervention. It's not only one intervention. Sometimes we have to scale this, and sometimes we have to go back in the stir. And uh, in some discussions, we have to go downstairs or upstairs. So I do believe that uh, the, the key is to be really organized. This is not a pathway to, uh, just to go on. Sometimes I have to go back. Sometimes we change in weeks, in days, or sometimes in hours. Thank you. Thank you very much. This also helped to all the attendees and people here. So we have a question for the Dr. Baker. Doctor, you were talking about a specific case, a teenager. So one of the questions that the audience have now, right now is what strategies do you use or well in those families, in those teenager families that when they don't want to talk about the death? They don't want to talk about the debt. What strategies do you use? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I think one of the most important reasons to have the whole team involved is that quite frequently, uh, adolescents and young adults may have particular people that they confide in, that they uh, do open up to. And it really has to be on their time and um, at the moment that they want to share what what they're hoping to share and this is the really critical nature of relationships in this work and i think it's why i love what i do as much as i love it because without this relationship being built across time it really is quite complex to understand and help families and help adolescents in this particular case of the question uh, come to a point where they're comfortable sharing with us um, particular uh, insights as to what what they may or may not be thinking about. Sometimes we may never even have a direct conversation with an adolescent about this, but we always want to create space. We always want to encourage the family to create that space as well. And I think that what we have to do is use the entire team, work with the entire team, encourage the team to create that space and opportunity for those adolescents to have these conversations. I have, uh, Dr. Wolf talked about times when perhaps our words have caused harm. Uh, I think back to when I was a trainee and in, in my mind, it was so critical that this adolescent who uh, was, had a, cl had a uh, clear cell sarcoma and, and he had progressive incurable disease and it was so clear to me that I needed to talk to him about the fact that he was dying. And I came into the room with my agenda, with my decision of when I was going to tell him and how I was going to tell him. And I, I will never forget the impact that it had. His name was Tyler, and I'll never forget the impact that it had on Tyler. That because of my agenda, my decision that it was time for us to talk about this, I hurt him. I hurt him with my words, I hurt him with my conversation. And so we really have to very gently move through these uh, situations and spaces and recognize that it may be somebody else's job on the team to do that. It may be the parent's job to, to have some sort of conversations as they go on. I think the main thing to do is to create space and opportunity and to make sure that there's an openness of communication across time so that it doesn't become this urgency like I felt with Tyler. Uh, but instead may come across more naturally. Um, I also think that there are real wonderful opportunities with therapists, art therapy, music therapists, uh, through all of these other activities where perhaps an adolescent or a child won't tell us exactly what they're thinking, but they'll begin to draw a picture or sing a song that may give us insights as to their recognition uh, that they're approaching end of life. And that can be very important to be able to convey to the team. Um, and, and it's another reason that we really must provide this multidisciplinary collaboration. Thank you for that. Yeah. Question.
Gracias, Dr. Baker. Yo pienso que a veces... Thank you, Dr. Baker. I believe that sometimes as 18, we feel a lot of pressure uh, to talk about those things when we see that the patient is, well, let's say getting worse, but uh, what you're saying really, really uh, relieves us a little bit or it's, because there are some cases where possibly we will not get to that point. We will try it, of course, but Dr. Wood, uh, you want to say something, right? Yeah, I just wanted to um, agree uh, with Dr. Baker and add that I, I really uh, think it's important to recognize that we sometimes in the healthcare profession come from a different culture, even like a medical culture in and of itself is very different from individual family cultures. And we have to be very respectful of the communication culture within an existing family and not fracture that. Even if our culture suggests being very open and transparent, we have to be uh, understand how a family typically communicates and not necessarily expect for that to change. And then the second thing I just wanted to add was that at the same time, we might be able to teach our parents how to talk to their children, just like we're teaching ourselves. And it may not come naturally to know how to communicate with adolescents or younger children about these very serious matters. We might give them some tools. So for example, the hardest question that we face as clinicians and that we have a lot of emotion around is if a child or a parent asks, am I going to die? that can be like a paralyzing question, right? Same for parents. Can you even begin to imagine what it would feel like if your child said, am I going to die, mommy? Oh my goodness. So my immediate reaction is to say, oh no, you're going to be fine and to provide reassurance. And that's how we feel as clinicians as well. So how do we teach parents to respond? We say, pause, take a moment, take a deep breath, just like Dr. Baker taught us. And then to say, I want to answer that question. And I also want to know what you want to know. Tell me a little bit about why you're asking me that question right now. Because for me to best answer it, I want to understand that. That helps to understand, you know, what is it that are they worried about pain? Do they want to talk about their faith? Um, we don't know until we explore a little bit more. And that gives us also, it gives us a moment to collect ourselves and then to be able to, and to teach families to collect themselves and then to be able to respond. And so a child might say, well, I'm afraid of dying. And then the family may know that in their family, their culture is to think about their faith and to remind a child about who's, that they'll be in God's hands if that's what works for that family. But we don't know until uh, the family explores further. So we have to teach our parents. And just to re return to my initial point and respect their family culture, their family communication culture. I totally agree. I believe that uh, this really helped us to face these situations that are really challenging for us as a team, palliative care teams. And it goes on hand to the next question, which is very common and it's connected with the perceptions of the rest of the medical team. The question is, how can we contribute? How can we help the family to understand the prognosis or the diagnosis of the child by and not to affect the hope? Uh, Dr. Jones, maybe I'd like you to tell us a little bit. I mean, that is a scenario where we are going to prioritize the comfort. How to manage the hope with the families of the patient? Another excellent question. And I think it's really important um, to uh, understand a couple of things. Some of our, uh, some of the research that has been done 
So a lot of the work of Dr. Jennifer Mack um, has shown that when we provide information to families, even upsetting information to families, first of all, they want it and it doesn't necessarily take away their hope. So we, we can't worry that by being truthful and clear and compassionate in how we communicate that it's going to um, damage or hurt our families. In fact, it helps them. Um, we don't take away hope through our prognostic disclosures. And we know that families hold hopes for um, even, and, and when, we, when we give information about prognosis, we might suggest to a family that the chances of uh, disease uh, eradication and long-term survival are 50-50, let's just say, and they want information. And sometimes we have to ask them the, the way in which they would like to hear that information. When we say that, we also say that for your child, we don't know the outcome, that there's a lot of uncertainty and that our, our hope is to help you live with that uncertainty and to prepare for the best and also prepare for the possibility that that won't, won't happen. So we hope for the best and we prepare for the possibility that that won't happen. And in, in being able to hold multiple hopes at the same time along with families, uh, we provide them with that added layer of support, the cloak that Dr. Baker talked about that doesn't destroy them or take away their hope. I, I think Dr. Baker has something to add. See, that was, that was incredible as far as the dis discussion goes there. I want to also lead this up. This is a art that bereaved parents um, helped us create. And uh, I can send this article around uh, Dr. Jimena so we can share this. I completely agree with Dr. Wolf. One additional piece is even when the uncertainty is removed, meaning that a patient has incurable disease, families continue to potentially use terms that make us believe that they're in denial. But they created this art with us to tell us, please allow us to water those hopes to use our words to speak about our dying child as if they're going to be here with us forever and will be cured even as we are releasing them and recognizing that they are going to die. Very frequently, the words that they use may make us worry that they don't understand, but the reality is they fully understand. It's just so terrible that they can't verbalize it or the things that they use to verbalize is just continuing to deeply hope and frankly believe that perhaps there will be an alternative outcome, but also believing that their child and knowing that their child is very likely to die. And I, I these parents encouraged me so much because when, when I was coming through my training, I always thought it was a one way or another. And it was almost like a seesaw, like there was understanding or there was denial. But the reality is just as Dr. Wolf mentioned, both hopes can be held in that same time. And parents may be speaking about their incurable, their child with incurable cancer going to the prom or going to a dance or graduating from high school, while at the same time making decisions to uh, make funeral plans or make decisions for after the child dies. And so we have to also allow space and it gets to the cultural issues that Dr. Wolf was describing there. And I think very frequently, uh, we attribute denial to patients and families that really are not in denial. They may be using words or terms that, that concern us, but they have integrated the things that we have told them before. They just aren't speaking in, in that same way that, we, that would make it so clear to us. So I also think we have to be um, cautious uh, to make sure that we aren't harming uh, patients and families by continually, you know, abusing them almost with the information and saying, don't, don't you understand? Because so frequently they do. Me, me encanta haber escuchado esto porque es I una... really like uh, to hear what you're saying because it's a very common situation. Always, always we believe that the parents are in denial. 
And uh, well, I do believe that it's a concept that maybe we are abusing or it's overusing and it's not what we are really seeing. I mean, to close this question and to go to the last questions, Dr. Wolf, Dr. Jones, in one of your articles, uh, I remember in regards uh, uh, about uncertainty, the palliative care needs to help the families to navigate in the uncertainty, but it means that we as a team, team palliative care team, we also need to accept the uncertainty. And I believe that right there, that's the difficulty. Sometimes we, I mean, we've been trained, we want black or white black or white, the two choices. And well, that uncertainty, I mean, sometimes makes us a little bit crazy. So if we do not have said that uncertainty is gonna be very difficult to transmit to the families. So that is something that I remember from your articles that you have published. So, well, thank you. We're going to the last questions is from a pediatric temperance. I, just, I think Dr. Ricardo had something to add also. I, I don't wanna, uh, did you, Dr. Luis Ricardo? Did you want to add something? Sí, sí, yo, yo realmente quería, gracias, doctora. Well, yes, uh, thank you, thank you. I really wanted to, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. I do believe that one of the biggest problems is that actually in all the vocabulary, technical vocabulary, not wanting to take away the hope of the families. Uh, part of what I always do with the team or with the families is I have the privilege to help to tell them that that hope is, is their hope. Nobody will be able to, nobody has the right to take that uh, hope away. So one exercise is to listen what you have to listen and not to listen what you don't have to listen. So we need to be really, really careful because maybe uh, you can start thinking like, I will not listen to that because maybe that is important for me to be able to uh, surf in the process. So there are some things that I always say that what is not curable is, I mean, sometimes we help the families to return to the first, uh, that expectation when we say, for example, there is nothing to be done. That is another sentence that, um, for example, Dr. Joan mentioned that what not to say, what not to say, like we, there is nothing that we can do. No, that is very damaging. That is uh, very, very damaging or dangerous in the relation family doctor. So to return the hope to the family is, is to use some sentences or phrases that have been mentioned. And I can tell you, it's not possible that as doctors or physicians, we have studied for many years. And finally, we say to the patients, there's nothing to do. No, the problem is that we need to redefine our goals in order to say, well, yes, we can do something uh, with clear goals. So I believe that this is in order to keep the goal, sorry, the hope of the families. So uh, thank you very much. It's very, very important. I mean, for us to keep into account that there is always something to be done. Or, it's, I mean, another title that I really like it is what to do when the pediatric, there is nothing to do. What to do? It means that there is always something to be done. Well, the last question, and Dr. Marcela Pizarro said that in some places in Latin America, we have some problems, economical, financial problems, of course. We have limited resources. And in some cases, in some hospitals, they consider that the palliative care is expensive or that it's an unnecessary expense. Some tips or the strategies that you can give us, we are beginning in these pathways. I mean, talk to the directors or CEOs of the institutions in a very effective way. What can we do in order to promote, to foster, to do some lobby for palliative care? What can we do? I'll just, in, in light of the time, mention a couple of strategies. One is that some of our data show that um, palliative care integration decreases length of admission and emergency room visits. And we can figure out together why that would be because we're actually providing more continuity care and um, preventing emergencies and crises. So that would be a good uh, strategy from a healthcare utilization perspective. 
palliative care also unburdens other clinicians uh, by taking them away from needing to spend as much time with the patient. Um, and so they can actually do the business of other types of care. Uh, so we share the responsibility. And then finally, um, uh, palliative care helps with other clinicians burnout. And so we can help with that from a financial perspective because burnout lead, leads to turnover of staff and that's expensive for hospitals to retrain staff. So there are three important reasons, cost savings, sit time saving and decreasing burnout of staff and staff turnout. That's my little speech. <laughs> I, I completely agree with that. And Dr. Wolf, the, the extra thing that I would add is it really needs to start with one full-time person. Sometimes we think about a grandiose plan, but just start with one full-time person and have that person create a team around a palliative care situation. And, and you then can start with a pilot. I think what we think to try to do is we try to recreate the packed team in Boston right away. And we think about this robust, huge team start with one person and you can see what a tremendous difference it makes but don't start with part of one person because this is what happens quite frequently is somebody will say oh good dr jimena thank you for being the palliative care doctor the oncologist thank you for running the fellowship program and for doing all of the other work no we need one full-time person just doing palliative care and build from there i'll just i'll just modify that very quickly should be two people sharing one position because one person should never do this work uh, all the time. It's too much for one person. That's all I want to add. And and Dr. Ricardo, I saw you said something to you. Gracias, doctora. Mire, yo, yo yes, quiero... thank you. I would like to tell you how was the experience in the Misericordia hospitals and all this happens around because we were trying to make many decisions. There were many decisions difficult to, to make. There were many children and they have, they were in pediatric service, but also there were many children that were, or there are many decisions that for the team were very, very heavy from the ethic and moral standpoint or point of view. So right there, there was a necessity to establish in a service knowing who the service was going to be directed to. So my recommendation by listening to the Dr. Bacon and Wolf doctor is to identify the population that uh, it's going to be the goal of the attention or the service. I mean, if you have 100 uh, children that are uh, attending in the hospital or the institution or whatever you're working, you need to determine, I mean, basically like the two big groups, the idle group, those children with um, hazard conditions and limited condition, and that's the ideals. I mean, we would like to start with the ideal, but no, in order to go faster, we need to, before uh, the smaller group are those children that passed away because of those uh, high limited and hazard condition is a group a retrospective group where you have to identify from 100 kids that you help, how many kids could be susceptible to be attended by a team of palliative care, pediatric palliative care. And in that sense, you will find some data or numbers that are going to be really amazing. The administrative or management part, we need to talk in the language that they know. I mean, they know the medical uh, terminology, but they understand numbers, the statistics. I mean, if we talked about the amount of children that are going to receive the benefits of the palliative care, and besides that, we talked about how much uh, more than we are going to free from other, spe uh, other specialties, like oncologists, infectology, and some other specialties that at the end of the day, they are, are taking care of those children. So it's another way to tell to the upper board, look, we're not only gonna help these children, but also we are going to help that other doctors that are already suffocated, they will be able to have, uh, be much more dedicated to one specific work and these kids will receive a, a better attention. So that's the recommendation, identify the group based on the data, what are those children that um, are going to be the beneficiaries and then to represent these with a projection in the time. What is the plan for the future? It's not gonna be only like, saying I'm going to be doing palliative care, what are the goals and to establish what are the goals, maybe the goals for uh, a specific 
uh, institution are going to be very different to the Misericordia Hospital or to a bigger hospital. So I believe that those things have to be clear so that we can discover what is the language for the management people, for the people in the board. It's true, I believe. Well, thank you very much. All the audience is really enriched. Is really, I'm really happy. I really thank. It's been a pleasure and a honor to have you, the three of you, and the other, uh, the other five people, all the doctors and physicians. I believe that this is the beginning for many videos from the talks in YouTube from the Valle de Lili Foundation. There will be right there saying, if you're interested, we can share the talks of Joan Wolf and the doctor, Justin Baker. So thank you very